California Humanities is an independent nonprofit, and we seek to connect, to connect Californians to each other. And the core question we try to answer is this. How can we better understand each other? How can we better understand what we have in common rather than what divides us? And so we do this through grant making that amplifies lots of different voices around the state, and we tell stories in other humanities-based programs in libraries, museums, schools, and more. And one of the projects that we supported is the photo exhibit you've been, been seeing projected here, um, a project called Democracy in the Fields, um, an exhibit of photos by Mimi Plum, who is a young photography student in Salinas Valley in that summer back in 1975. I'd also like to thank Fresno County Office of, Administ of, of Education and Bob Bullwinkle for connecting us with art teacher Edward Silver, Silva from Bullard High School and his student Adeline Gamez. Um, you may have seen her beautiful piece of art out in the lobby um, of Cesar Chavez, and if you, if you haven't seen it, I encourage you to take a look. Uh, she has a lot of talent, and we thank you, Adeline and Mr. Silva, for, for being here this evening. Before we get to our esteemed panel, we're really delighted to welcome to the stage Jose Gomez. He's a third-year theater arts acting major at Fresno State, and I also want to thank Nora Chapman from the College of Arts and Humanities for connecting us with Jose. And he's going to perform for us a short monologue from the play Blue Willow by Pamela Sterling, which premiered here in Fresno in May of 2016. Um, and he's going to be uh, doing a monologue in the role of Frank. This play was influenced by the 1940 young adult book written by Doris Gates, who was a longtime Fresno-based uh, librarian who worked with migrant children. And the play weaves the past and the present voice of the migrant within the Central Valley, and we thought it would be a really uh, wonderful introduction to the discussion today. So, Jose, over to you, please. I was born in 1945, came from Mexico, 150 miles from the border, brought over as an infant with my mom, and landed in the Tulare County of California. We moved to Fresno. I was about eight or nine when I was out, out in the fields, back-breaking work, sun up to sun down. You eat as you go. There was no shade, no restroom, no water jugs. Water and food you carried with you. Okay? Making raisins from grapes. So you put the grapes on a paper at a 45 degree angle so the water would roll down and the grapes would dry. You roll up the grapes like a tortilla. Next stage, the tractors would come to pick up the rolled grapes. And that's a grape and the raisins. Picked everything. Almonds, figs, used to be picked by hand. Now everything is done with machines, except grapes. So, but you gotta pick grapes for they're ripe. Kids today couldn't handle half a day picking grapes. You see, growing up, it's never easy. My father left in 1960. I was 15 when I was out on my own. I used to take the labor bus from Chinatown to go pick cotton. I hated picking cotton. You used to cut your fingers from the sharp ends of the cotton and... <clears throat> we were paid by the pound, not by the hour. Paid in silver change. And just when you thought, couldn't get any worse than that. My mother married my stepfather.
He'd always hit me. I was the oldest kid and the only non-biological kid of my stepfather. I got hit a lot. But I never hit my kids. A child cannot defend himself. But I never give up. Because once you give up, you give up the hope in living. You gotta go the right way, or you'll end up in the big house. I was no angel, I was alcoholic. You don't know how much you miss until you hit bottom. Making up for lost time now. Everything's paid for. Kids, grandkids, doing okay. I got a timeshare now. I like to travel. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jose. I think that really sets the stage for the discussion to come. Before I turn it over to the panel, I'd like to ask each of you to um, take a look at that evaluation form that's in your uh, program. We would love it if you could complete that. It helps us to see what works with these events that we're doing across the state and what you would like to see. Um, and if you turn it in this evening, you'll get a lovely uh, on the road with California Humanities tote bag, because you can never have enough tote bags. Uh, so if you can complete it and hand it out to uh, California Humanities staff outside, they will give you a tote bag. And so now over to our speakers. Um, we have with us our Pulitzer Prize winner, uh, Miriam Powell, author and journalist. We have Don Mabalon, who's an associate history professor at San Francisco State University. We have Samuel Orozco, the author and national news and information director from Radio Balengue here in Fresno. And our moderator, Luis Valdez, who really needs no introduction, uh, playwright, director, founder of El Teatro Campesino. And we, in particular, are excited that he's here in Fresno after his trip recently to Washington, D.C. to accept the, uh, the National Medal of Arts from President Obama. So congratulations. <laughs> Thank you, Julie. Well, I am going to moderate this panel. Uh, do we need this? I don't think we need this, right? Okay, there it goes. Uh, we're going to be covering, I think, uh, quite a range of topics within the larger topic of the farm workers' movement and what happens now, you know, after Chavez onwards. What is happening, what is going to happen, all these perspectives from these four individuals. I will have also my own commentary to make. Uh, for whatever it's worth, I was born in Delano in 1940, and uh, I grew up as a part of a migrant farm working family. We used to work up and down the valley, uh, did Fowler, did Selma, uh, and then uh, moved uh, eventually to the Santa Clara Valley where my family settled in San Jose in 1953. We worked in the fields there too, picking tomatoes and garlic, whatever there was, uh, until uh, I, I got a scholar, graduated from high school, got a scholarship to go to San Jose State, and that made all the difference uh, that I can see in my life and, and in my family's life. Education was a key feature in, in helping us to leave the fields. At the same time, though, I was very aware, having grown up uh, in migrant camps, that there was a real problem, and that uh, I wasn't interested in helping myself, I was more interested in helping those that were still in the labor camps. So even though I, was, uh, I opted uh, to major in English and become a playwright in college at San Jose State, I developed an idea of a theater of by and for farm workers. So in, uh, in 1965, I went to Cesar Chavez and I pitched him the idea of a theater of by and for farm workers. 
And uh, he said, well, there's no money, there are no actors, no money to do theater in Delano. There are no actors, uh, there's no stage. Uh, there isn't even any time to rehearse. We're on the picket line night and day. Do you still want to do it? And I said, absolutely. Uh, I, was, I was plugging into the, the spirit of what was happening in Delano that Cesar and Dolores and, and Helen had started. And so uh, I joined as a volunteer and slept on the floor with Pink House and with everybody else and, uh, and participated and learned. Along the way, I began to see that the Caesar was right. The only place that the teatro El Teatro Campesino could come into existence was on the picket line. And so that happened roughly a, year, a month or so after I got there when the Campesinos voted me as a picket captain. I was able to then conduct the chants and the songs and stuff that I'd learned in, in the civil rights movement within the context of the farm workers movement. So the Teatro Campesino took hold on the March of Sacramento in, in the spring of 66. It performed 25 nights in a row, which gave us a real solidity. And then the rest of the Teatro history we became a company. Uh, we officially separated from the United Farm Workers in the fall of 1967, but moved to Del Rey, and out of Del Rey, <laughs> <laughs> began to initiate uh, really the Chicano cultural movement by taking it to universities and colleges, and it became essentially the, the Chicano arts movement. Our murals that we left in Del Rey are still in Del Rey. We're trying to get them out of there to an appropriate museum. Maybe the Fresno Art Museum would be the place for them but we need some help to do that. In any case, um, we have El Teatro Campesino is now over 50 years old. We have devoted all our time. The last 45 years, our base has been in San Juan Bautista, where we began to help the union uh, organize in Salinas for those first few years in the 70s. And so we've been active uh, in, in the farm workers movement since 1965. We feel that the injustices that existed then are still obvious in the fields today. There is a greater need for the union now than there ever has been, but it takes a lot of effort and a lot of doing. As Cesar used to say, uh, hay más tiempo que vida, there's more time than life. Uh, but then he also used to say, los pobres no tienen dinero, pero tienen tiempo. The poor don't have money, but they have time. And so we invest with hope in our time hoping that other people will volunteer to serve this great cause and to bring justice finally to the fields of California. We'll be talking about that with different voices here. So let me go immediately then to my left here, La Compañera, Pulitzer Prize winner Miriam Powell, who has written a couple of books about the United Farm Workers and our history, and ask her to make her comments. Okay. okay. Um, so I was a journalist for 25 years and the last thing that I did was a series at the LA Times in 2006 that got me deeply into the farm worker movement and from there into the history and writing about some of the things that Luis was talking about. And ultimately, I wrote two books, one that is a history of the movement and one that is a biography of Cesar Chavez. And so I have for the last 10 years lived in and this story in many ways as a as an observer and as a historian. Um, I find it to be both one of the most inspiring stories that I have ever worked on, researched, and, 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 and an inspiring group of people who came out of the movement, and also at the same time one of the most tragic stories because, as Louis said, there are so many of the problems that are with us today and that ultimately the union failed as a labor union, although it succeeded as a movement in many ways. Um, to me, it, the, the issues that confront us in general today, but particularly in the Valley, the Central Valley of California has the highest rate of income inequality of any place in California. People think that income inequality is greatest in San Francisco or in Silicon Valley. No, it's in the Central Valley where the income difference between the rich and the poor is 14 times. And that's because the income for farm workers is so low. And so, so many of the conditions that Cesar Chavez and, and, and Luis and Gilbert Padilla, who's here tonight with us, who's one of the co-founders of the union, um, fought for... <laughs> the issues that came up in, in the 60s and in the 70s, have come around again in many ways. So farm labor contractors who were one of the things that, that, that the union set out to eliminate, that middleman 
are back in force today. Um, so to me, as both a historian and a journalist, it's imperative that we learn from the lessons of the past and the history, both the successes and the failures, and figure out how to use those techniques that were so effective back at a time when farm workers had nothing, had no protection under any laws, which is not the case today. There are health and safety and labor laws that, that protect farm workers and the, the significance of the farm worker overtime law, which was just signed, is probably not as much in a monetary sense as the fact that it says for the first time in 80 years that farm workers are not second class citizens and have the same rights as other workers. That's a, certainly a moral and a symbolic victory. Um, but the techniques that Chavez used in how he was able to inspire people like you and like so many others who joined the movement and became organizers and learned and took those lessons and went out and organized other people and are active today in lots of progressive movements. How did he do those things? Um, those are things that I think we need to return to. It's a time when the labor movement is very, very weak and I think a lot of people are doing a lot of soul searching and I know in the Valley also, there is a kind of a renewed effort to do community organizing. And so I think there's a lot that we can learn from, from those things. I was watching um, a clip of you. There's a, on YouTube, there's a great link which maybe we'll send out to, to, as a follow up to this, but there's a, a film that was made in 1968, I think, right, called Duelga that was narrated by Luis. And you can see what he looked like in 1968. You were, you know, young. It's even older, 66, 67. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah. Um, but in, it's the March to Sacramento, and there's footage of the March to Sacramento, and you can see, and there's this wonderful monologue that you give where you're talking about the power, what it meant for farm workers to march on Highway 99. And it, there's a quote that's something like, you know, if you had said a year ago to a farm worker, you're going to march up, you know, you said you're crazy. And then you have thousands of workers, and that sense of empowerment and you know, ultimately to me, one of the greatest legacies of Cesar Chavez is the idea that the poorest people in the state could take on the most powerful industry and achieve these remarkable victories. And there's a lot that we could learn from that. Okay, good, good. And if you are formulating, yes. If you are formulating any questions, we are going to have a Q&A session after everyone has had a chance to speak. And then we can dialogue here as a panel. So uh, we keep that in mind. I'm going to keep going to the left. I think we need to move further to the left. To left. Here. <laughs> uh, I'm all the way here on the left. It was one of my privileges uh, to participate in the Delano Grape Strike at the very beginning. And so I'll never forget the day that we all went into Filipino Hall. And uh, the AWOC at the time, under the leadership of Larry Leong, invited the National Farm Workers Association to come, of course, and use the kitchen the strike kitchen and, and to have our meetings there. It was a big, it was a big jump, you know, because I can remember a day back in, in Delano when I was a kid when there was a lot of racist, racist clashing, you know, between Filipinos and Mexicans. And it was an amazing experience to see the unity that grew out of Filipino Hall. And so in that interest, I want to introduce then Don Mabalon and give her uh, perspectives as a Filipino American. So. <laughs> Or as an American, whatever. <laughs> well, thank you, Luis. Uh, to say that it's an honor and a privilege to be on this panel is such an understatement. So I am so happy to be here. Um, I am the granddaughter and the daughter of farm workers. Mm. And I'm from up the road. I'm from Stockton. I was born and raised in Stockton. I'm a third generation Filipina. Um, I, uh, I'm a professor in the history department at San Francisco State. And uh, we'll go back just a little bit. Um, I'm the first generation in my family that has not worked in the fields. Um, education was key. The EOP program sent my mom to UC Davis. And uh, my grandfather's, my grandfather had a college degree, still working in the fields. My father had a college degree, worked in the fields. So um, I don't take that for granted at all. And I know that all of the work that they did in the fields is so that I could sit here in front of you. Right? So I could have the privilege to be able to teach and to study. So uh, I went to UCLA as an undergraduate. And at UCLA is where I, I took ethnic studies. And I can't, I can't, how many of you have taken ethnic studies classes here? Right? Life changing for me. Because it put my grandparents and my parents' experiences in context. 
And I understood why there were so many old single Filipino men in my community and why all of us were, you know, in the fields and why we were segregated on one side of town. And uh, I went to Stanford for my PhD in history and my dissertation was the history of Filipinos in Stockton. And what I found was that it wasn't just about Filipinos in Stockton, it was really about Filipinos in the United States from about the turn of the century until the 1970s. And so I basically am, am talking about how Filipinos are racialized, excluded, create a community, um, and I look at farm labor, and I look at gender, and I look at, at culture, um, all the different kinds of elements of, of, of community story, and I weave my family's history through it and a lot of oral history. Um, in the process of researching that book, um, or as I was researching that book, the Filipino community was in the process of reclaiming this history that we have in the farm workers movement. Um, when I was an undergraduate, we had the amazing experience of having Philip Veracruz give a book talk. His autobiography had come out. Um, unfortunately, I don't have that copy. My dad took it with him to Delano and all the monos shared it because they wanted to see if they got mentioned <laughs> and what Philip Veracruz had said about them. But in the process of writing this book, I realized how much farm worker history had been in Stockton. And most importantly, people um, who we are in the community and in, in kind of the larger field reclaiming Larry Itleong, Pete Velasco, Philip Veracruz, Ben Hines, Pete Manuel, people who were leaders of, of the AWOC. And I was stunned to realize that Larry Itleong had been the next door neighbor of my auntie. I mean, these were people that were in my community and were heroes, but we didn't know about them growing up. And certainly we weren't being taught about them at the college level. And so uh, my dad knew Larry Yitleong. They were, they were lodge brothers in the same lodge. And, and uh, in the last 10 years, really, there's been this amazing and massive interest in, in trying to find out who Larry Yitleong was, what was the role of Filipinos in the farm workers movement, and not just so that we can, you know, oh yeah, great, we were part of this movement, but, you know, my project right now is a biography of Larry Yitleong, and it's my hope that it does a few things. One, it inspires young people in our community to be activists and to be organizers. Um, Filipinos are not in the fields in the numbers that we used to be. We used to be about 30% of the farm labor force. Um, when my grandfathers came over in the 1920s, I mean, it was uh, Mexican and mostly Mexican and then 30% Filipino. However, Filipinos are the workers of the world. The Philippines sends out more laborers than any other country in the world. And they are some of the most overworked and working in some of the worst conditions that you can imagine as home care workers, as nannies, and in factories, right? So these very inspiring figures of Larry Leung and Philip Veracruz and Pete Velasco tell us as a community how important it is to fight for workers' rights. Um, and it's also inspiring for the next generation to be inspired to be organizers. So we've um, done things. So, I founded a nonprofit organization in my hometown called the Little Manila Foundation to preserve the remaining buildings of Little Manila. And some of these buildings are actually places where the unions actually met, the very powerful unions in the 30s and 40s, from which people like Larry at Leon came out of to then later on organize the AWOC. And we're planning to hopefully rename a street in Stockton, Larry at Leon Street. Um, you know, Larry Yitlin came from Stockton, and nobody knows that history. So it's not just for Filipinos, but for everyone, you know, in the hope that young people realize that they can do something extraordinary, even if they come from farm worker roots and from the wrong side of town in Stockton. So that's what I've been working on, kind of, um, kind of piecing together um, the life of, of Larry Yitlin in particular, and hoping that book um, will not just be about Larry Yitlin, but about Filipinos and the farm labor movement in general. And like I said, with its purpose to inspire a whole generation of people to become more politically aware and to organize the Filipino workers of the world, really. So. Wonderful, thank you, John. <laughs> Yay. You know, in 19, 1971, I had the opportunity to go to, the, to Manila uh, under the auspices of the ITI, the International Theater Institute. Again, when you're an artist, you suddenly get exposed to other possibilities. And so under the auspices of the UN, I went with a group of, of directors to Manila. Uh, it was the 400th anniversary of the founding of the Philippine Islands. 
of the Philippines. And that was 1971, because they were founded in 1571. And so far. Well, the Spanish came. Yeah, in 1571. When the Spanish came. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> exactly. And, and, and took over Manila. And, 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 but the Spanish galleon trade that started from 1571 was shipping uh, all of the treasures of Asia from Manila to Acapulco. And with them came the first Filipinos that came to the New World. They came to Mexico and settled in Acapulco and eventually made all the way to New Orleans, believe it or not. I mean, it's the history of the Filipino community. But the fact is that the relationship between Mexicans and Filipinos has been going on for 500 years. I mean, it's not something that just got going. It, it's an old one. So it was great to see that come together in a delaying grape strike. Um, okay, so now on to our next speaker, uh, Samuel uh, Orozco, uh, Radio Bilingue, who is here to talk, the director of the news, and I'm sure he has his own journalistic perspective. Samuel, llévate la mano. Gracias, Luis, eh, y un gran honor igualmente estar en estos momentos con ustedes. Eh, eh, un gran saludo en estos momentos, ya que estamos hablando de farm workers, to the workers, the Sakuma Farms uh, workers in, uh, in the state of Washington, who are actually just celebrating uh, the, the, the election of a union, the first independent indigenous-led union in the state of Washington. And, uh, let me tell you about uh, my connection to uh, the Movimiento, Movimiento Campesino, or to farm work. Uh, I joined uh, Radio Bilingüe back in uh, early 1981. I responded to the call for volunteers. And uh, I showed up uh, at the station, at the then uh, station at the Fulton Mall. And uh, one of the reasons why I, I decided to stay was because I saw all these signs showing uh, signs from La Huelga, uh, from the Movimiento, and from El Movimiento Chicano, from El Movimiento Campesino and Movimiento Chicano. That got my attention, and uh, I decided to stay at Radio Bilingüe back in early 1981. I come, actually, I grew up in, in a railroad company town, which at the same time is the home of the largest uh, railroad uh, workers' union in northwest Mexico, which is in Palme, Sonora. And an experience that defined our life in town was 1959, a general strike, farm workers, general strike that was uh, um, uh, cracked down by the army. And the town eventually got divided into the strikers and a small group of scabs. And the, 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 the strikers and the government and the strikers and the new leadership uh, which was imposed by the government. That experience defined our life for, for generations, actually, in town. That experience, actually, was the one that connected me, uh, not so much to farm work, but rather to the experience that farm workers uh, were uh, uh, having in those days, in, uh, in, uh, in 1981. Um, probably the first... Uh, major experience that I have of reporting uh, for Radio Bilingüe, for uh, the, the reporting the news for Radio Bilingüe, was what happened in September of 1981. The union had the, their constitutional convention in the, at the convention center uh, downtown, and uh, you know I went to basically cover the event uh, full day, basically reporting on an hour to hour basis, uh, just uh, running to the convention center, going back to the Fulton Mall, getting the, editing the interviews, getting them on the air and all that stuff. And the, basically the way, the plan, the idea that we had in mind when we first uh, decided to plan for this coverage was uh, to have, uh, you know, this story about uh, David uh, versus Goliath, right? Type of story, the union versus the then powerful lettuce and grape uh, uh, growers, and, um, and uh, also the, the fact that the rising power of the union, the fact that the, the union in those days uh, had so many contracts around, so many elections, so many strikes going. I think the membership was in the neighborhood of 40,000 to 50,000 members. So that was the, the, the high days of the union. Uh, Governor Brown actually was the keynote speaker in that convention. Mm -hmm. That was the, the, the story idea. What we found was something different, actually. What we found was a, a, you know, a, a big surprise. We had heard uh, some rumors about simmering conflicts within the Union. What we heard, what we saw basically was the explosion of those conflicts on the floor 
of the convention. Um, the, uh, the, actually, there, there was a group of dissidents that we usually associated with the Salinas Comites de Salinas. Um, well, they were on the floor, they were outmaneuvered, and uh, they left, and uh, they staged uh, an angry protest uh, outside the convention center. So that was basically the beginning of, uh, well, that was basically my baptism of <laughs> fire in the news reporting work when it came to covering the Movimiento Campesino. So uh, that was basically, uh, again, the, uh, an experience that uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, continued defining our work, that the, the Movimiento was a little more complex. At, at some point in time, um, in, the early, in the mid 80s, after covering the Union, after covering the Movimiento, uh, I, I, I had an exchange with uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, uh, that was probably in 1986 or 87. And I offered uh, Cesar, I proposed Cesar to uh, uh, basically discuss uh, uh, the issues related to the movimiento, the issues related to the, actually, basically what I proposed to Cesar was uh, to discuss what uh, we're discussing today, to basically come up with a forum similar to this one, where his uh, view, he would articulate the view and the, uh, and the hope uh, for the future of the union and the movimiento, and that we would also have different views you know, to the union in a forum such as this one in town. Uh, uh, he questioned the need for such a forum. He basically uh, uh, asked uh, why aren't we having a talk about the bigger issues. And the bigger issues are related to the grape growers, uh, the grape grower business. Uh, as you may remember, the third uh, grape uh, boycott was uh, uh, in place in those days, uh, 1987 probably. Mm -hmm. And uh, why not that? Why not a, a, a debate with uh, Pavish, with Jumarra? Uh, I think the, the other guy was uh, Saninovich, maybe. And uh, so we agreed to that. Basically, I said, well, well, why not? And uh, with the condition that uh, we were going to discuss uh, at some point uh, the future of the union. I mean, uh, a, a nice open discussion with the value of the future of the union. Uh, well, uh, I never was able to actually get Pavish, get Jumarra. They used to be in China or Canada or other places, and getting all them together in one place was of course, impossible. It was a long shot. We didn't have uh, either the, the, the proper capacity to convene uh, such a forum, but we left that discussion open. I mean, the, 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 that uh, forum was left on the back burner. Eventually, uh, Cesar Chavez went into you know, his uh, fast, uh, the longest fast, and uh, years later, he passed away. Uh, that discussion, I think, uh, you know, was long overdue in those days, especially because of the fact that, again, when I began covering this, uh, um, uh, the, the, the movement, uh, you know, we were talking about, uh, you know, thousands and thousands of farm workers uh, who were actually unionized, who were members, uh, thousands who were covering uh, uh, by union contracts. Everything has declined, you know, since uh, those days. Uh, at some point, uh, there was a critical need you know, for such an open debate uh, among uh, farm workers and supporters. And, uh, and I believe that the debate is, uh, well, that discussion, that dialogue you know, is still uh, overdue. Uh, Cesar passed away. We were there at the funeral, actually, in the Cuarenta Acres. We broadcast live. And what I sensed uh, at the funeral was this, uh, there was a, 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 a a, a, a big, you know, huge sense of uh, sadness, uh, grief. Uh, people were crying, actually, especially, you know, when uh, Nati Cano y Los Camperos, you know, they were playing, they were playing Amor Eterno, Las Golondrinas, people crying, really. But at the same time, I sensed uh, a, a tremendous uh, feeling of, uh, of resurrection, you know, people like uh, renewal and resurrection. People were hoping that this was going to be something mal que por bien venga, algo así. ¿no? En ese funeral, you know, we interviewed the old timers, remember in the old days, as well as the, the chavistas who, the former chavistas, the chavistas who had left, were there too, probably with that same hope 
in mind that somehow the union uh, at some point was going to recover and go back to the good old days, the days of, uh, of the height of the organizing work. So that discussion, I think, uh, is still pending, and I'm glad that we had this opportunity uh, with you uh, to, to, to continue uh, that conversation, to continue that dialogue in terms of uh, uh, what are the challenges. And at this point, uh, what I have uh, in terms of, uh, of, uh, of the movement and in terms of the union is uh, more than answers, what I have is questions. That's what I do for a living, actually. <laughs> And uh, uh, basically, I facilitate conversations on the earth, especially with the listeners. And, uh, and, and that's what I have, basically, uh, uh, a lot of uh, uh, questions about uh, the future that uh, you're asking about. Good. We need to ask those questions among ourselves to begin with and then open it up. I, I think that uh, there's a number of things in what you said you know, that provoke certain questions to me. Uh, one is the question of leadership. Can uh, the generation that produced Cesar Chavez, Dolores Huerta, Gil Padilla, uh, all Manuel Chavez, you know, all of the original pace setters for the strike, uh, can we create another generation? How is another generation like that created? Uh, I, I do recall that in 1961, CBS uh, broadcast nationally Harvest of Shame. I don't know if you saw that. Uh, it was with Edward R. Murrow talking about the condition of farm workers. It had to do with southern farm workers, African Americans in the south, but anybody that was Mexican could identify with that had worked in the fields. But that really reflected a, a tenor in the country as a whole. There, it was ripe for a compassion, a, an act of compassion toward farm workers because frankly things were going well in the country economically and the middle class could then look beyond its own needs and think, what about the people that are deprived? And, and I think that helped the 60s to happen the way they did. The conditions today are very, very different. The attitude toward immigrants, the attitude toward farm workers are as racist as they've ever been, uh, meaning that if you're Mexican or, or black or Filipino or whatever, you know that, yeah, well, the fields are good for you. Because it's an attitude about farm labor its, itself that, that kind of automatically makes you think that this is for peons. And that's a Spanish word, by the way, which means people on their feet, as opposed to caballeros, the people on horseback who were the bosses, the white men on horseback, the Indians on their feet, peones. But anybody who works in the fields is liable to be thought of as a peon in this country, probably illegal, undocumented, not worthy of being an American. So they should be grateful for the few pennies that they get. I think that, in a sense, the plague of racism in this country uh, is, is endemic, you know, in American agriculture. It's just worked in. And even if you're white, as the Okies were, they, they get almost a racial distinction to themselves for a while. And so uh, I, I think that that's an important thing that needs to be addressed because it's still with us, even more virulent than ever. And, and it has a lot to do with the origins of this country and the fact that black people were enslaved for the first major industry, agricultural industry in the country, which was cotton, and then tobacco. And then when California was developed, it was the Chinese and the Japanese and the Filipinos and finally the Mexicans that ended up working in the fields because they, um, they were lower on the totem pole. So it was all right to discriminate, to not pay, pay them as much, to give them longer working hours and housing them in barns and chicken coops, wherever. All of that is, is still with us, and I think it's a question of education, but it's also a question of attitudes that have to start from the bottom up. I don't know. Let me toss this one out and see what you think. Well, I, you know, I mean, listening to both of you, one of the things that strikes me is that there is some really strong farm worker organizing going on in this country. It is not going on in California. It is going on a little bit in Washington State, where you mentioned there's an independent union, and it's going on in Florida, where the Coalition of Immokalee Workers has t adopted a different model. And one of the things that I would throw out is maybe we are in a time, and this is true not only in terms of farm workers, but other low-wage workers and professions, where labor unions, as we've known them, are not necessarily the best method for achieving the kinds of changes that unions traditionally have. So the Coalition of Immokalee Workers makes a clear distinction. They are not a labor union, but they have negotiated agreements that really have a lot of the protections that we would think of 
and that were part of the farm worker movement, you know, here in its, at its height. They have a system that's essentially a grievance system that is very strict, that has very quick adjudication of any kinds of grievances, that has mandatory education in the fields, that has very strict anti-sexual harassment policies, They've, and, and also some financial, you know, penny per pound was the original thing of the tomatoes. So that's a model that I think is being looked at by a lot of people. The Immokalee workers are expanding now out of Immokalee, Florida. They're doing some things with dairy workers in Vermont, and I think they're doing training. In other words, they were, some of their leaders were involved in the strike in San Quentin in Baja, California, which people may have followed. It was within the last year or so of strawberry workers. They went to help them there. The Driscoll and workers. The Driscoll workers, exactly. Um, but those so are Mexicans, right? That's entirely That was in Mexico, Mexico right. Yes. But, but that, um, they have used, they have now launched a new campaign against Wendy's, right? The, you, you can talk about that a little bit. But, um, but I think they're adopting a lot of the old UFW tactics. They're going to students and campuses. They're doing boycotts. And they're, they're also framing it in very much um, the kinds of, I think, moral terms that Chavez and the movement did at its height, which is to sort of confront people with the reality of, of, of the life of a farm worker and say, really, you know, you need to see this. And is this really, do you really think people should live this way? And if not, are you willing to pay, you know, two pennies more for your tomatoes? And people generally have responded to that. You know, the other thing I would throw out there is the whole fight for 15, again, as a different kind of model, where the, the fight for 50, the, the fact that $15 is becoming the minimum wage is probably going to have more impact on farm workers in California than, than anything else that the state has done in a long time. Um, and that campaign, which started with the McDonald's workers, and pr probably people have seen that, but it was very similar in terms of that very clear-cut black and white you know, I'm a worker for McDonald's, this is what I make, I have to work this many hours, this is what my life is like, then I go home and I sleep for three hours and I work at another job for six hours just to pay my rent. And, you know, is that right? And people respond to that. And I think that the success of the Fight for 15 is there, there are things in there that could be used in the well, fields as Don well. Don had mentioned that the Filipinos are like the migrants of the world, you know, yeah. which is, yeah. they're in Dubai, they're, you know, throughout... Mm -hmm. Yeah. Southeast, you know, they, they, they're mm -hmm. all over because the world, I mean, it's globalization, let's yeah. face it. It's, and that's, that's a term that's out there and we're all relating to it on some ways. There are people that want to deny it. No, it's not happening, don't want it. Uh, the presidential campaign is rife with these questions. But it, it impacts on agriculture as well directly. The Driscoll strike down in, in Baja California uh, is an extension of Watsonville, as far as I'm concerned, because that's where Driscoll is based. Mm -hmm. right. And that's in my neighborhood up there, up there near San Juan. And, uh, I mean, I see those two uh, uh, examples, the strike in Baja and Driscoll in Watsonville, as an example of, of globalism, you know, and how the more and more uh, the United States is importing uh, certainly mangoes, but also potatoes and grapes from other parts outside of the United States. And that's going to impact on, on, on the price of agriculture in this country. Uh, maybe that's too big a subject, but I think it's one that, that really hits on, on our livelihood here on, as farm workers. And uh, it's part of the politics of our day. We need a much wider understanding, it seems to me, in, in, in terms of the realities of farm labor. If we have so many people coming from Mexico with or without documents to work, uh, there should be an international agreement of some kind. I'm not talking about a return to the Bracero program, which was uh, an excuse for exploiting Mexican workers, but I think that it needs an international viewpoint in order to be able to iron it out finally in terms of its implications. Uh, we, in Delano, and the, maybe Gil can back this up, in Delano, we were so involved in just trying to survive that it was basically us. When that horde of strike breakers was brought from the border by the growers to Delano, we faced the whole immigration question on a daily basis. We were being flooded by people that had no documents, but nobody was asking them for papers, man. They were just there to break the strike. And so there was a lot of resentment that developed, and the union had to bring it under control. No, these are your own people. Don't be insulting, you know, the immigrants because they're looking for work. So that one had to be worked out, but it's still a problem. And I've often wondered why why there isn't more communication between 
the interested parties in Mexico and the interested parties in the United States, just with respect to immigration and uh, providing the workforce. It's an issue that will come up. Hopefully, it'll be under uh, a woman president, you know, that we can work these out. Uh, but the, the thing is that it, it's crying for some kind of international viewpoint and solution because it is part of this whole global perspective of the world. Everybody, I'm sure Filipino workers in Dubai are shortchanged. They're not paid enough. They're exploited, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I was thinking, um, you know, Miriam, when you were talking about kind of the inspiration of, of kind of the UFW and past movements on current movements, and for Filipinos in particular, and I kind of mentioned this, I mean, the domestic care worker mm -hmm. issue is huge. Mm -hmm. You know, we're not in the field so much anymore, but we are in the care homes, and we are, oh, at, you know, working as nannies. I mean, I was just on a panel in New York with a, a Filipina that owns a restaurant, and she says, well, downtown where I have my restaurant, I'm a restaurateur. I go to the Upper East Side, and I'm someone's nanny. You know, I mean, that, you know, and I was just in Europe in November. I mean, we, Filipinas are the ones taking care of the elderly, taking care of the young, but in particular, in California, I mean, there's a big issue with overtime. Mm -hmm. You know, so, I mean, looking at the overtime, you know, the, the struggle over overtime pay for farm workers recently, there's also the same struggle for overtime pay for domestic bill. care right. workers, right. who, as the population ages, mm -hmm. it's Filipinas and Latinas who are increasingly being um, relied upon to provide the care for the nation's elderly and work sometimes 18, 20 hour days, you know, and live in the home. You know, and so a lot of their campaign does rest on this issue of, you know, we are taking care of your parents, of your grandparents. Don't we deserve dignity? Don't we deserve a living wage? Don't we deserve overtime, breaks, vacation? You know, the same things that farm workers were asking for 50 years ago and asking for today. And I would say that the successes that have come for, for the domestic care workers okay. and for farm workers have come because people went out and went door to door and did community meetings and did the basic nuts and bolts of organizing that isn't really being done that much anymore. And the Driscoll yeah. is an interesting example because why wasn't the boycott against Driscoll successful? Because it hasn't been. And I mean, it's sort of been called this. The Washington people now have called it off. The Mexicans are still whatever. You have the headquarters in Watsonville. You know, there was really no I knew about the boycott, but that's because I follow this stuff. Yeah. There was not, you know, there was not really an effort because it's a lot of work. Well, talking about the generation, so go ahead, you want something? Go ahead. Sure. No, I, I basically just, just want to echo some of these questions that uh, you are uh, addressing. And, uh, and I'm just going to leave them as questions too. And one is uh, the fact that, I mean, we've been talking about the, the decline, basically, of union membership, uh, the old kind of union membership. <laughs> in the farm worker movement, and which is very dramatic. Uh, I'm just wondering if this is not related to, I mean, the forces that are provoking this decline in the farm worker movement are not ex exactly the same forces that are provoking, that are causing the decline of the labor movement in general. In the whole nation, I mean, I understand 50 years ago, one out of three workers used to be unionized. Now it's only one out of 10 in the nation, in the old uh, uh, type of uh, manufacturing industries. I believe that organizing in the fields is uh, way, way harder than organizer, organizing in a traditional union way in uh, the cities, in urban cities, in manufacturing areas. It's way, way harder. It is, uh, I think it requires uh, organizing in the fields uh, well, number one, I mean, in terms of organizers, I think it requires uh, the Cesar Chavez types. In other words, uh, somebody organizers would come with uh, this uh, tremendous espíritu de sacrificio. You know, the, uh, Cesar Chavez, uh, we know through all the bios that have been written about him, is that he basically gave his, li his life to a single issue, to a single causa, you know, and everything else. So it requires that kind of organizer, union organizer. There are so many great, talented organizers these days, but very few, of course, you know, would endure all the challenges that go with the extreme poverty in Los Campos. You know? and, and number two, I think it is, a, a, it, it is a union busting, union busting uh, uh, tactics. They are 
easier you know, to perform in the field, in the ag industry, as opposed to the manufacturing areas. One thing is, uh, I mean, uh, you have in the fields, basically, labor contractors who rely on all these uh, hometown uh, paisano bonds. That's one thing. Number two, it is easy for a, a grower to just uh, invest and disinvest, move their capital around the different crops, and just uh, you know easily to uh, you know take off, uh, take away, basically deflect uh, any striking blow. H two A problems, Brasero problems are flourishing these days over problem. here. So I wonder, and I just wonder, if union, unionization organizing in the good old union way is the way to go in the fields. Right. In California has gone down and those organizations that have tried it in some other states, Pecun, mm -hmm. in uh, Oregon, uh, WCIW, in, uh, in Florida, they have gone nowhere. So they have uh, experimenting, they are experimenting with more creative right. ways uh, in other words, they're experimenting with a social movement type of model. In other words, involving, uh, mobilizing the consumer power, the environmentalists, uh, alliances with environmentalists, uh, human rights, civil rights groups, immigration, immigrant rights groups. Uh, uh, so I wonder if, again, you know, unionization in the traditional way is not the way to go, and instead, basically taking the cues from all these groups, uh, the California groups and groups elsewhere, including the people from San Quintin on the other side of the border, who are experimenting with new creative uh, strategies. Well, I think part of it, you know, is that it has to be, history has to be put in perspective. I, I, I like history because it allows me to look at things, how things came to be the way they are today. One of the things that you got to say about Cesar, Chavez and Dolores Huerta, Gil Padilla, uh, all of the organizers that originated the Atlantic Great Strike, this is a post-World War II generation. Some of them are, are, were GIs, were veterans of World War II. There was a time of optimism in the country, at the same time that there was a tremendous conservatism that began to set, the anti-communism thing. Uh, but never, they kept working, they kept working, Martin Luther King kept working, all of this is the post-World War II generation becoming active, and there was a rise of optimism in the country. The one thing that I, I accuse the labor movement, the organized labor movement that came out of the 30s of doing is they dropped the ball, they lost it because they allowed the prevailing uh, opinion in the culture to become anti-union. It, people were lackadaisical and, and complacent about defending their unions and unions became eh, every day, you know, it was just about wage raises. But the, the idealism got lost. Delano brought that idealism back to the fore for a while. It was able to hold, but actually the country as a whole uh, doesn't like uh, unions or working people because not, that's not where the culture takes you. Even the most people, most people are, are, have to work for a living and they work hourly wages and are not that well off. But one of the reasons that Trump uh, is so popular among people that have no business supporting him it's because he represents a culture that says if you cheat on your income tax, it's because you're smart, okay? And if you treat women like pigs, it's because you're smart, okay? And, and this guy represents the worst in the country, but it's out of that attitude that created the anti-union fervor in this country. It, that and the anti-communist movement. They said, no, you gotta destroy the labor movement because it's communism. Well, that was bull. That was a lot of bull. And the labor movement let itself be plowed under when it never should have been plowed under. It should have been stronger than ever. But it needed, it needs constant generations, like the generation that came out of World War II that was optimistic for a while. The new generation, where's it going to come from? That's the question. Unless we, we, we generate it, unless we, we create it out of, out of the millennials, you know, that are coming along. They, they have to be positive, they have to be willing to take work long hours, to sacrifice in order to make changes happen. But I, I don't see that immediately in the horizon. I, don't, I see a lot of people out there protesting, which I think is great, Black Lives Matter. I, I see people objecting to violence in the streets, police brutality, so forth. I hope that that generates something. But it has to connect with something concrete like wage levels, union contracts, 
and, and something that will, will raise the standard of living for everybody. So let me just piggyback on what you, what you said, Samuel, because I think what, you're absolutely right that there are these new models that are out there that are coming up. And I think that even within the labor movement, and the labor movement even more recently bears responsibility for its own failures because it's gotten <coughs> sort of fat and happy Complacy. and it's become yeah. absolutely. And if you, you know, there are now court cases and challenges that have been eating away at what's left of the labor movement. And if there's the Supreme Court case that on the public employees ever gets resolved, the largest union in the country is gonna lose as much as a third of its membership. Because if people voluntarily can withdraw from the service workers employee, you know, they will. And, and that's because the unions have not given people a reason to believe in them and to be something that is more than a transactional relationship. And so that is, I think, where the worker centers and people like the Immokalee workers are trying to recreate the kind of spirit that will motivate people to have some sort of joint sacrifice, that there's something beyond, I'm gonna get more money out of this. So there is a lot of soul searching, I think, even within the labor movement today, outside of the fields, about you know, what do we have to do to recreate the kind of spirit that came about briefly, certainly, in the, and that the UFW at its height epitomized. Well, hopefully, you know, there are young people that are asking yes, the same questions exactly. and are able to take it to the next. Listen, we've been round and round. Can we open it up and ask for questions? Because there is time for a Q&A, and, and we can entertain that now. now I dedicated my, my young life to the farm worker struggle, both with the UFW and with CRLA. And I hear what you're saying. You know, there are tactics that can be used. But if we don't have the tools to move forward and represent and ad adequately assist the people, you know, we're lost. And one of those tools, and, and that's going to be my next campaign as soon as I breathe a little, is um, taking on the Williamson Act. That's an act here locally that the growers and the ranchers have been using to not pay sales tax. Mm -hmm. And our assessor recently took it on and said, I want to reassess your property because a lot of them aren't growing shit anymore. And the Board of Supervisors said, no. That's tax money that could be going to our schools. That's tax money that could be going to fixing our roads, fixing our, our parks, et cetera. But that also gives us an even feel. Why should farm workers who live in small communities like Parlier have to pay taxes and the growers don't? So I'm pretty upset about that. The other thing is that you talk about the boycott, and I keep asking myself, because I'm kind of like getting old and forgetting a lot of stuff, but what's the issue with the secondary uh, boycott prohibition? Remember that issue came up during the ALRB? And those are things That's that California that, has yeah. to address. I mean, I gave 16 years to CRLA, and, and one of those big cases was against growing ranches. I mean, that's why I have white hair. <laughs> And it was a horrible battle. But the best tool that we had, which has been gutted by Congress and legislation, was the National uh, Migrant Seasonal Agriculture Workers Protection Act. There, we could not only sue the contractor, but we could also go after growing ranches. We, and, and they treated them as equal, you know, under the federal act. And they gutted it. It was covering transportation, it was covering work, it was covering housing conditions. I mean, it was a powerful tool, but they have gutted it, and then they went after legal services. You know, and so I left because I could no longer represent undocumented. I could no longer do class actions, and we could no longer do, um, we're, I'm sorry, I'm taking so much time. <laughs> we could no longer do um, um, attorney fees type of cases where we would get paid to be able to do more cases. And so, you know, it's easy to look back and, and if you're not aware of all these dynamics that were happening that were tying our hands more and more, that's something you also need to discuss. I still deal with farm workers in my mental health field now and they still don't have benefits. You know, and, and one of them um, is the brother of, a, of a, a shooting victim that the police killed and I call him up at 6 o'clock because I figure, pues ya salió del trabajo, ¿verdad? He goes, no, doña, aquí ando en el arroyo. <laughs> Second job, rolling the trays. 
you know, because they're not making enough money. And yeah, the overtime went in, but it's not going to go in until 2022. You have a question for the panel? The question is, you know, when we look at, I'm sorry, when I, we I, look I, at the I, issue, I, you need to address those type of other right. issues, the and, dynamics that went into depowering us. And I would say this. The state of California still has to this day the strongest pro-labor law in the country, the Agricultural Labor Relations Act. Nobody is using it because there is no union out there organizing. So it is there. You have a governor who has put people on the board that are doing everything they can to try to help farm workers, but the, the, the act is set up to have a union that is petitioning for elections. That is, it is an incredibly strong law. And the UFW had its greatest successes when Ronald Reagan was the governor of California and Richard Nixon was the president. And in some ways, that was helpful because Chavez had an enemy and an adversary. So good organizing can be done. I understand what you're saying, and there certainly are, are lots of forces arrayed against it. But there are, there are, are plenty of ways that, that could be done. You know, young people could be organizing, but they're not. I see words formulated on your face, eh? Um, no, no. No, okay. <laughs> is there another question? Here we go. I have a question. Um, it seems that there is a generational gap today that uh, deals with ideology. The ideology that began the labor movement back in the 60s uh, is no longer here with us. And it seems like the, the founders of this movement have not been able to uh, update themselves with the changing of the time. The changing of the time today implies a different dynamic and a different uh, set of eyes and a different set of communicating as well. Um, so how do we then uh, bridge this generational gap, number one, and how do we do it with the people who are actually involved in the fields, right? Because probably very few of us here are involved in the fields nowadays. So these people nowadays, they're not documented. Uh, they can't speak English, they feel disenfranchised from the society, and they don't have the stability of mind to say, this is my country, right? Back in the 60s, the Chicanos who made the, the movement thrive said to themselves, I too am an American, right? And today, we don't have that in the fields. So how do we then adapt ourselves to this new shifting demographic that does not see you, right, the founders of this movement, as, as people that they should follow, or they invested in their own lives. Go. Yep. I think uh, the, uh, part of the answer is in uh, paying attention to what uh, those uh, projects, organizing projects that we were talking about are doing these days. Uh, the Imokali workers, one, uh, the Pecun in the state of Oregon, um, the, 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 the actually Mixtec organizers here in California and Oregon in the state of Washington uh, organizing themselves through hometown associations to resist labor abuse uh, by paying attention to what they are doing. And this is a new generation, actually. You know, much of this organizing is being uh, uh, conducted, is being done by uh, younger organizers, uh, young uh, organizers. Uh, so by paying attention to what they are doing is, I think, where we're going to find the answers to where the future of the movement is. All these, uh, uh, again, apparently isolated efforts that, uh, you know, boycotts, uh, they're using primarily the, the, the tactic of the boycott and the, the use of the media, the use of social media, and, uh, and again, good good old organizing, in other words, house meetings uh, and direct recruitment, et cetera. By paying attention to those creative uh, organizing efforts is where I think we're going to find some light for the future in the fields. Let me interject, again, speaking from, from my area of experience, uh, which is the arts. Uh, when we moved uh, out of Delano, we came to Del Rey, uh, which we came to know during the March of Sacramento. And what we established there was El Centro Campesino Cultural, the Farm Workers Cultural Center. Basically what we set out to do, as a young group of very young people, is to provide the tools of the arts to poor people. We figured we can just do that much. If they can learn to speak for themselves, as we had seen in Delano, if you can speak for yourself. Acting is not just the act of going up and imitating stuff, you know. 
It is the act of getting up for the public and feeling free and confident enough to speak your mind. That's the idea. And if you, if you have to sing it, sing it, but get it out there. And then if you can paint it, put it on the wall. Or if you can write it, put it into a poem or a story. That essentially has been a success story in terms of the, the Chicano arts. That, that There are a lot of young people that are tapping into it. Uh, but we've always insisted that whatever you write, whatever you do, should have a social conscience. That you can do without a cent. When I went uh, to Delano, I just had a couple of bucks in my pocket. I didn't have any money. Uh, as a matter of fact, Cesar asked me, do you have any money? I said, no, you know. And he said, we'll give you $5 a week. I said, great, that's it, you know. That's all I need. I'll eat at Filipino Hall, you know. But, but the fact is that without a cent, we were able to start a theater movement in the same way that Cesar Dolores and Helen and Gill and the others were able to start a farm workers movement just by being there. Now, the, the, it's the beginning. We find we have to continue to do that. Fifty years later, we're still doing that. But it has led to some tremendous places. You know, Washington is not going to change until there are more Latinos that are represented there. We had a fine moment during the middle of the art ceremonies in the White House. Suddenly we noticed, God, there are a lot of Latinos here. And how many times have there been this many Latinos? If it took the arts to get that many Latinos there, that's a great thing. But what follows upon that is the politics. The two Castro brothers were there, you know, Joaquin and Julian. And, and they're the future. I look at them, I said, man, you guys are the magic twins. That's what I told them. You guys are the magic twins. Yeah. You know, we're counting on this new generation to be here in the House of Representatives, in the Senate, and to vote for justice, you know. And again, we got to make the electoral process work as well as it can. It's not, that's not the only thing. We have to organize our communities. But rather than just oppositional politics, it has to be positive politics. You have to give people a sense of pride, a sense of ownership, a sense of having something. And this is where the culture aspect came into uh, Del Rey, you know, when we brought the teatro there. And here in Fresno, we were on Van Ness. We were here for a couple of years, you know. My wife and I got married here on Clark and Thomas, an old church, you know, which is now the freeway, I think it's a 41. And, and you know, we, we, were, we, went, we had no money. But the first art exhibit of Chicano art was on our center, our storefront in Van Ness, and that spoke to thousands. Mm -hmm. And so you can do stuff without money, but you've got to stay positive. You've got to stay creative. I believe in this country. I believe in the United States of America as an American, but I also believe in America as a continent. And I think that, if anything, Latinos have to work toward the benefit of Latin America as well, as well as the Philippines, as well as any of the countries that represent Americans. We have to work for a better world. I'm not against globalization. I think it's a good thing as so long as it isn't for corporate profits. I think we all need to help each other in the world. But we've got to start in our own communities, we've got to start small, and you've got to be willing to sacrifice, but be positive. Make it work for yourself. I belong, in addition to the United Farm Workers, I belong to two very strong unions. You know, they'd have to pry, pry my f dead fingers from the, from, you know, this thing to get me out of there. But one is the Directors Guild of America, brilliant union, you know, and the other is the Writers Guild of America. And I get pensions and I get benefits and, and, you know, had medical care for a long time. I mean, all of that. There are great unions. I still believe in unionism. And I think that farm workers are more deserving of protection than a lot of the people that work in offices. I think that if you're going to bring people in from all over the world and from the poor quarters, like Mexico, to work in the fields, then like, like veterans in the battlefield, they should be provided with, with promises of education for their kids, citizenship immediately. If you work in the fields for X number of years, you're eligible to become an American citizen. How about that? Because who else is out here? All right, who else is out here? And, and the day that we truly boycott agriculture, bring it to a stop, people will realize how vital and essential it is. Yeah, I, I just want to add uh, one more thing, and this is uh, that uh, adding to that point is that change may come in different ways. Uh, unionization used to bring, and continue bringing in those areas where it is successful, uh, basically the the motion, uh, the movement of the worker into the middle class, into making a, 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 a common worker part of the middle class. In the field, uh, well, I mean, I think the goal and the aspiration continues being that. In other words, that by unionizing people, bring the farm workers into a middle class uh, type of job, right? Uh, the, the, the farm work. So far, I mean, it's been more like a dream. You know, it was a the, dream. The, but 
Uh, one thing that I can say is this. Uh, just look at the experience of, uh, I was just talking the other day with uh, Filemon Lopez from the Asociación Benito Juárez. Back in the 80s, the Asociación Benito Juárez uh, was uh, organizing the fields. And basically, the tactic they used to have is engaging the growers, uh, resisting exploitation and resisting abuse through uh, labor, uh, through basically lawsuits. Lawsuits and CRLA was uh, very instrumental of this, and uh, Oregon Legal Services, et cetera. They engaged uh, uh, in lawsuits to resist abuse and exploitation. They work on legalizing uh, uh, immigrants. Uh, most of the uh, mixtecos in those days were undocumented, almost uh, all of them undocumented. They legalized uh, people. They uh, basically shamed uh, uh, contractors and growers by using uh, media, uh, the, the creative use of media, and uh, picket lines and all that stuff. Now, he's just telling me that uh, many of those people who became uh, legalized and who were actually benefited by uh, uh, those uh, uh, actions and who were members of the association in those days are currently they either own a house. They are not migrants anymore. They used to migrate from state to state. They're not migrants, own homes. And they're pretty much part of the middle class, in, uh, in, in many of them, in Florida. They're not working in the fields. And that's basically, you know, something that, again, uh, uh, organizing hasn't been successful in making field work a job that is part of the middle class. But many of these organizing efforts have been successful in... Uh, achieving the goal of actually lifting the life uh, quality, the life conditions of many of those people who become part of these organizing efforts. But what about the organizers, like Filimon, like me, that don't have a pension? <laughs> <laughs> okay, one more question here. Uh, Go ahead. Hi, I'd like to first frame my question, uh, my, my question by saying that uh, I'm in education, higher education, by the way, and uh, one of the things that I would like to comment on with the, you know, the decrease of unionization numbers is that there's a number of factors that I believe have contributed to all of that. You know, we have the water restrictions here in California, the drought. Uh, we have, um, you know, the, 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 the farms that used to house the workers now subcontract with contractors to bring in workers who are now hired to do the work, whereas before they used to live on the farms and uh, you had the families that then had children who then worked in the farms. And that's what I grew up in. My entire family grew up in farm work and we moved on into education, which is another thing is that the doors of education since the time that you were framing uh, have now been open at the community colleges and the universities. So there's a number of different things that have occurred uh, that are now completely different uh, now than they were in the, the mid 60s and such. And even television and media, you know, we used to, uh, television and media was black and white with rabbit ears, and now everybody's got smartphones and computers. So there's a, a, a complete change in, 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 in the entire uh, community that we live here in the Central Valley. Many of the students that I work with in Merced College who would otherwise be uh, farm workers or working in ag-related businesses are now working in restaurants, low-paying jobs like you were mentioning. So... My question then is, under that, is if we're looking at millennials or the younger generation to become the new leaders of the union, shouldn't, be looking, shouldn't we be looking at this new paradigm and figuring out not what worked in the past, but what we can do with what is going on today, and then frame this new model based on all these new conditions that we're working under? Yeah, I, I think that the, I would agree with that, but I think that that doesn't mean that the past is not valuable to learn from. Those who do not remember, learn the, remember the past are condemned to repeat it. Um, there, there are a lot of the basic lessons. If you look at the issues that Caesar and Gilbert and Dolores started with a community service organization before they even formed the UFW, it was citizenship classes, English classes, police brutality cases, voting registration drives. Those are all the same issues that we're confronting today. So all I'm saying in terms of the value of the past is that there are tactics and strategies that can be learned from and used because you know, one doesn't have to reinvent the wheel. And then you adapt them in the ways that, that we've been talking about and that Samuel was talking about into the changing world of technology and the nature of the labor market, which is completely different than it was you know, 50 years ago, of course. But there's a value to be, to, to look at what worked and what was, you know, how did you inspire people also on a very basic fundamental level? 
what kind of leadership does that and how do you develop that leadership in a new generation? Yeah, I mean, one of the things I was saying earlier is that, you know, there's this incredible need to organize Filipino migrant workers. And Larry Itliung and Philip Veracruz and Pete Velasco have really become heroes to this new generation who are learning about them through ethnic studies and through their Filipino American history classes and Chicano studies classes. So, you know, and you're in higher education, you know how powerful that is, right? To, have to, to, to need to know that history, to train this next generation of organizers um, because we absolutely need them. And, and at, at younger and younger levels, right? In high school and in, in middle school, you know, import, how important it is to have Filipino American studies, Chicano studies, ethnic studies, um, to inspire people essentially, to get them thinking about social justice at a very, very early age. One of the, the big victories that we've had in the assembly this last uh, two years ago, 20, three years ago, 2013, was AB 123, which um, it requires the teaching of Filipino-American farm labor history in California schools. Um, and this was major. You know, uh, for generations, Filipinos had been not learning anything, you know, thinking their whole lives, oh, it's just Cesar Chavez, it's just Dolores Huerta. You know, um, but realizing that someone who looks like them, who looks like their elders, could be engaged in something that changed the world. You know, that 2,000 Filipinos went on strike on September 8th, and that's one of the reasons why we're all sitting here today, right? For young Filipinos to start thinking about those things, young, you know, Mexican-American, young Chicanos, the younger and younger. Um, you know, and that's how we get this next generation, too, because we can't wake them up when they're in their 20s and 30s and say, hey, what about social justice? You want to come work over here? Right, because they're already gone. Right, we need them younger and younger to know these stories and then make their own stories. Even in '71, you know, when I was there, again it was a cultural event, but uh, I had a group of farm workers from the Philippines in the Philippines in Manila that wanted to meet with me because they knew I was from the United Farm Workers. You know, that I had a background, and and they wanted to talk about the farm labor situation in the Philippines and as well as immigration, which is. Uh, interesting, you know, because way on the other side of the Pacific, and yet it's related, it was home. By the same token, I'm going to share a little story with you, that the day that Cesar Chavez died, I was in Mexico, and I, I'd been there for a while, and I, I got an invitation to go on a comitiva, which is a special committee that goes with the president of Mexico, Salinas de Gortari in this case, whatever you may think of Salinas de Gortari. Uh, but he, uh, we flew that day from Mexico City uh, from uh, the Angar Presidencial, as they say, to um, Tuxla Gutierrez, which is in Chiapas. And then from there, we loaded onto army helicopters and choppered away over the Lacandon jungle to the Rio Usumacinta, which is the river that separates Mexico from Guatemala. And we went into a Mayan Lacandon village to dedicate a clinic with the president in, in black SUVs, you know, rushing into the jungle. And then we come back and got on the helicopters and back to the airplane and then on again to Puebla where he dedicated another hospital and then hopped on the plane again, this big 747 called Benito Juarez, which is Air Force One for them. And we flew to Hermosillo. And that night, that's where we spent the night. And that's the night that Cesar uh, passed away, not 100 miles away, you know, in San Luis, Sonora, in San Luis Arizona. And, and I didn't know, no one knew. But the next morning, we're getting on the plane, and uh, as we're getting off in Monterrey, the chief of staff, his, the, police, the president's chief of staff, kind of called me over, and, and I walked over there just as the Salinas, President Salinas was coming out, and then I heard the chief of staff say, Señor Presidente, tenemos noticias de que Cesar Chavez ha muerto, okay, that Cesar Chavez has died. And, and the president looked at me, he didn't say anything, but to me it was like a kick in the throat, man, it just... Because, I mean, it was a total shock. And we went into the day, and then it, it finally hit me, and I went off to cry by myself. But uh, that night, we were in Reynosa at a, a hall that was like Filipino Hall again to me. It was about the same size. And I looked at the audience. We were all campesinos. And it's the same people that were in Delano were in Reynosa across the border. Uh, of course, they were in their home turf. This was Mexico. Uh, but I said, why is this distinction between Mexico and our farm working areas? Why isn't there more communication? And I come back to that. I think that maybe some of the new generation of leadership can take a broader perspective and not get caught into the traps of 
us and them, or Mexico is over. No, it's all the same people. Same way with the Philippines. It's all the same people. And, and we need to help each other for the benefit of everybody. And, but it's got to be done with hope. And it's got to be done with creativity. It's got to be done with a sense of idealism that propelled the World War II generation to, to achieve social justice for a brief moment. But it can happen. It can happen if we, pres if we give that to our kids, if they pick up on it. Lupe and I had three boys during the great boycott. They were, were big men now, but they were little boys then. And we had a safe way, and we were all boycotting safe way. Well, the only thing we had to teach them is that that was a Fuchikaka store, you know? <laughs> and that's how they grew up thinking, it's a Fuchikaka store, we don't go there, you know, because of the grape situation. But anyway, there are ways to take the kids and to guide them until they can make up their own minds about what they want to do. But certainly, as Cesar used to say, there's more meaning in life if you devote yourself to helping others. I'm so sorry we have to end here. I feel like I could listen to this panel for many more hours. Thank you again. If you want to listen to this again, or if you want to share it with others who couldn't be here, there will be a video of it posted on our website at www.calhum.org. Uh, right now, we invite you to come out and join us for a sweet treat and a cup of coffee and a chance to talk with each other and with our speakers about what we've just heard. And don't forget that survey equals a tote. Thanks again for coming tonight.